How's it going, everyone? I uh, hope you're doing well. Welcome to our first lecture in the plants module. Today we're going to be going over uh, a little bit about the evolution of plants, and then we'll get into our seedless plants. So let's get started. So at some point, plants evolve on land, they evolve the ability to live on land, and they do so before animals. But going from the oceans to the land presents disadvantages and advantages. <clears throat> so let's get into talking about the disadvantages to living on land first. The first is desiccation, or drying out. And that's a huge concern from or uh, that organisms have when organisms are leaving the water and going to land. Water also provides buoyancy to organisms that live in aquatic habitats. So on land, plants need to develop structural support to stand up in air, which is a medium that is not going to give the same lift. Additionally, the male gametes, the sperm cells, must reach the female gametes, the egg cells, using new strategies because swimming is no longer possible. You can't swim in the air. The successful land plants are going to evolve strategies that deal with these challenges, but not all of those adaptations appear at once. Okay, so those are the disadvantages. Let's talk about the advantages. Well, the first thing is sunlight is abundant. On land, the light that is absorbed by that green pigment called chlorophyll it doesn't get filtered out by water or competing photosynthetic species in the water column above. It's just going to come right down to the, to the plant. The second is carbon dioxide is more readily available because its concentration is higher in the air than it is in the water. Why does it need carbon dioxide? Well, that's how it gets its sugar. Plants use photosynthesis to make the sugars that they use for their energy. One part of that is called carbon fixation where they take a carbon dioxide molecule and add it on to a chain of carbon a chain of other carbons and you get glucose eventually which is a six carbon molecule and so um, that's why they they're, they're so dependent on carbon dioxide they also produce oxygen as a byproduct which we depend on additionally land plants evolve before land animals and so, therefore, until dry land gets colonized by animals, no predators are going to threaten the well-being of plants. Now, that doesn't stay the case. Um, as we know, that situation changes as animals emerge from the water and find abundant sources of nutrients in the established flora. They get to eat them. So, in turn, plants then evolve strategies that deter predation spines, thorns, and then just being toxic. So those are uh, ways in which they avoid being eaten. Let's talk about something called the alternation of generations. The term haplontic refers to a life cycle in which there is a dominant haploid stage. Diplontic refers to a life cycle in which the diploid stage is the dominant stage and the haploid chromosome number is only seen for a brief time in the life cycle during sexual reproductions. Humans are diplontic. Now, if you're not familiar with what haploid and diploid means, it's talking about the numbers of chromosomes, haploid being the half amount and diploid being the full amount, or two copies. So in humans, the sperm and the egg are the haploid cells. They fuse together to form a zygote that is diploid. And so in the same it's the same case here. Haplontic refers where there's a dominant life stage that is haploid, and diplontic refers to the dominant stage being diploid, and the haploid chromosome number is only seen during sexual reproduction, like humans. Most plants exhibit what is called the alternation of generations which is called haplodiplontic, okay? And what that basically, basically means is that the haploid multicellular form is called the gametophyte. That makes sense because the haploid uh, number is the gamete. Um, in humans, for example, the gametes are sperm and egg, they're haploid. 
and that's followed in the development sequence by the multicellular diploid organism, the sporophyte. Okay, so I know there's a lot of uh, like sort of very biological language here, but if you write it all out, you make some yourself some flashcards, you'll get to get to know what they mean really, really rather quickly. The gametophyte gives rise to the gametes or the reproductive cells by mitosis. It can be the most obvious phase of the life cycle of the plant as in the mosses, or it can occur in a microscopic structure such as the pollen grain in the higher plants, which is the collective term for the vascular plants. The sporophyte stage is barely noticeable in lower plants like the mosses, liverworts, and hornworts, which we're gonna to see today, but towering trees are actually the sporophyte phase, the diplontic phase in the life cycles of plants like the sequoias and the pines. And so depending on what kind of plant we're talking about, the gametophyte or the sporophyte could be large or small. So here is uh, the image of alternation of generation. So let's start with the gametophyte. So the gametophyte produces gametes and let's just say this is the sperm and this is the egg. So one gametophyte produces the sperm, another produces the egg. They fuse to form the diploid zygote which then goes through mitosis, which is just copying or basically making a bunch of copies. So can you tell that this green circle is now a bunch of green circles? And this is the diploid organism, the sporophyte. The sporophyte organism, this could be a tree, a big tree or a little small other organism in the lower plants like mosses. Um, and it goes through meiosis. Meiosis is the process of going from diploid or two copies to haploid and they make uh, that makes spores sorry that makes spores that undergo mitosis which is just copying so can you see there's one little white circle to a bunch of white circles that becomes the gametophyte and that's alternation of generations so I hope that makes sense to you try to work that out uh, in your head and let me know if there's any confusion okay let's get into the seedless non-vascular plants. These are the bryophytes. The closest extant, which means still living, extinct means no longer around, extant means they're still here. The closest extant relative of early terrestrial plants are the bryophytes. The first bryophytes probably appear about 490 million years ago, but it's hard to say that um, really because they lack lignin, Lignin is the molecule that gives vascular plants stems their toughness. So without that, bryophytes really don't leave fossils. There are about 18,000 species of bryophytes which thrive mostly in damp habitats, although there are a few that grow in deserts. They constitute the major flora of the inhospitable environments like the tundra, where their small size and, of course, tolerance to desiccation offer distinct advantages. So if these are the first plants that come about, it makes sense that they're going to be small, very tolerant to drying out, and um, often be in environments that are otherwise pretty inhospitable. So here's one. Here's the liverworts. And you can see these guys are really like almost like leathery. That's, that's how they, they feel. They're really thick, and that is because they're very tolerant to drying out. They don't dry out. They hold on to water. This is the organism that's most closely related to the first land plants, and there's still 6,000 of these species today, the liverworts. Next are the hornworts, and there's about only 100 species of these, but these guys are never far from a water source. And it makes sense. If this is you know similar to the first ever land plants, well, it's not like they would have gotten very far. So they need to be close to a water source. That's the liverwort, I mean, sorry, that's the hornworts. Then we talk about the mosses. We're probably very familiar with mosses in some aspects. There's 12,000 species of mosses. Their habitats vary from the tundra, where they're pretty much the main and only vegetation, but you also find them in the understories of tropical forests. On the tundra, they're shallow rhizoids, so they have th things called rhizoids instead of roots which are just basically shallow little things that allow them to fasten to a substrate, but don't, you, you know, it would be impossible to dig into the frozen soil of a tundra. Um, and so this is just the takes place of the roots, basically. They slow down erosion, store moisture and soil nutrients, 
and they provide shelter for small animals and are food for the larger herbivores, such as something as large as the musk ox. So really, mosses are quite important. They're also very sensitive to air pollution, and so they can be used to monitor the quality of air. So really interesting organisms. Okay, so those were the non-vascular plants. Now we get into the seedless vascular plants. The vascular plants are the dominant and most conspicuous group of land plants. There's about 275,000 species of vascular plants, which represents more than 90% of Earth's vegetation. There's several evolutionary innovations that explain their success and their spread to so many habitats. The first is, well, the vascular tissue, the xylem and the phloem. Xylem is the tissue that's responsible for the long distance transport of water and minerals. Xylem up to the leaves and phloem down to the roots. Keep that in mind. The transfer of water soluble growth factors from the organs of synthesis to the target organs and storage of water and nutrients. Phloem, which transports sugars, proteins, and other solutes through the plant, uh, goes down from the leaves. Phloem cells are divided into what are called sieve elements or conducting cells and supportive tissue. Together, xylem and phloem tissues form the vascular system of plants. The roots, okay, this is another advantage, uh, another uh, evolutionary uh, part of the plant, gives support. The root system transfers water and minerals from the soil to the rest of the plant. The extensive network of roots that penetrates deep into the ground to reach sources of water also stabilizes trees by acting as a ballast and an anchor. Don't believe me? Go try and pull out some kale from a, a farm. Those roots are so strong and so hard to get out. Um, try to push over a tree. You're not going to have much success uh, because of those roots. The leaves. The appearance of true leaves improves photosynthetic efficiency. Leaves are broad in these true leaves. They're green, filled with chlorophyll. It helps them capture more sunlight with their increased surface area. And then we have pine cones. The mature fronds of ferns and flowers are all sporophylls, which are leaves that are modified structurally to bear sporangia, or whatever makes the spores. And then strobili are structures that contain the sporangia. They're prominent in conifers and are known commonly as cones. For example, the pine cones of pine trees are the strobili. Okay, the, now we talk about more about the seedless vascular plants. By 385 million years ago, plants have evolved vascular tissue. So remember, 490 million years ago for the first ever land plants, 385 million years ago, we get vascular tissue, well-defined leaves, and root systems. With these advantages, plants increase in height and size, and really the ability to just dominate the landscape. Swamp forests of club mosses and horsetails, with some specimens that get to reach more than 30 meters tall, covers most of the land. These forests gave rise to the extensive coal deposits that gave the Carboniferous era its name. In seedless vascular plants, the sporophyte, the sporophyte, by the way, becoming the 2N or the diploid stage, becomes the dominant phase of the life cycle. Water is still required for fertilization of seedless vascular plants, and most favor a moist environment. The modern day seedless vascular plants include club mosses, horsetails, ferns, and whisk ferns. Let's take a look at those. So here's the club mosses. The club mosses or the lycophyta are the earliest group of seedless vascular plants. But you can tell, look, look at this, they're standing up now, right? That's because they have vascular tissue. They dominate the landscape of the Carboniferous period, growing into tall trees and forming large swamp forests. So they get over uh, dominated now by newer organisms. Um, later evolved organisms, so they don't really grow into large, tall trees, um, but they are still around. Today's club mosses, like I said, they're diminutive, evergreen plants consisting of a stem and small little leaves. You can see them here, and those are called microphylls. Okay, and then we get to the horsetails. Horsetails have only a single genus, Equisetum. Equis, equis, equine is horse, so there's horsetails. They are the survivors of a large group of plants known as the arthrophyta. Where have we heard arthro before? 
perhaps jointed appendages, arthropods. The stem of a horsetail is characterized by the presence of joints or nodes, hence the name arthrophyta, which means jointed plant. The majority of <laughs> the majority, I should say the, the majority of the photosynthesis they do is done in the green stem and not actually in the leaves. The leaves are very, very small, um, don't have a lot of surface area, but the stems, you can see the stems back there, that's where the majority of photosynthesis occurs. Then we get into the ferns down here and the whisk ferns up on top. Ferns are considered the most advanced seedless vascular plants, and they display characteristics that are commonly observed in seed plants, but they are not seed plants. Ferns form large leaves, and they have branching roots. Whisk ferns lack both of those, which is an evolutionary reduction. I mean, they, they, that something somewhere along the lines, they shared this characteristic, but then evolved to not have them anymore. Ferns have large fronds. This is a frond and are restricted to living in moist environments. With that, we've gone through the seedless non-vascular and the seedless vascular plants. Let me know if there's any questions and I'll see you in the next lecture.